After this I looked, and there before me was a, a multitude that no one could count, from every people, tribe, nation, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And I love that picture. Uh, people from every nation, uh, from Australia to Afghanistan, from Botswana to Brazil, from Italy to Iran, from the UK to Uzbekistan, all the nations gathered together, every tribe, the Tutsis and the Hutus, the, the Maasai warriors, the Himba herders, uh, speaking their, their native language, all the tongues, Aramaic and Arabic, Bengali and Malay, Swahili, Spanish, Yiddish, Zulu. All these people gathered together and they are so different from each other. This wonderful, colorful, symphonic spectacle. These people have nothing in common except the blood of Jesus. All these people from different races, different ethnicities, different cultures, different traditions, and they are worshiping together, singing, salvation belongs to our God. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks be unto him. Friends, that day is going to happen. That day is a reality. This multitude of people that is too large to count, and we are all so different from each other. Who are these people? And John says these are people who have washed their robes and they've become white in the blood of the Lamb. These are people cleansed by the blood of Jesus. People redeemed by the blood of Jesus. People from every people group. It's not about race, color, culture, or customs. It's about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And on that day, one day, we'll be one family with one Savior and one song. And I love that picture. I love that picture because it should shape the lens through which we see all people today. Listen carefully. It's not about your skin color. It's not about your culture. It's not about your ethnicity or your traditions. There is one Savior, one Lord, and one throne. And maybe, just maybe, if we really believed that, it would stop racism. Uh, racism is, quote, elevating one race above another, attributing to one race intrinsic superiority and valuing that race above another race, and then treating others as undesirable or evil. Racism is social exclusion, segregation, demeaning comments, treating with disdain, being suspicious or fearful, and treating other people with inequity. And it's been said there's a, a little bit of racism in every one of us. And maybe you're offended by that. Maybe you're thinking, I'm not racist. I think we're just blind. We're just blinkered to our subtle racist tendencies. I'm not talking about the, the terrible segregation of blacks from whites in America 100 years ago. I'm not talking about the black slave trade that only finished 150 years ago. I'm talking about the, the subtle assumptions that we make about other people based on their skin color. I'm, I'm talking about the, the demeaning comments, the cheap ethnic jokes, the mocking of accents. I'm talking about how we, we just naturally gather with people like us and then arrogantly assume that the, the majority way is the right way. I'm talking about the black father who is asked by his five-year-old son, Daddy, why do the white people treat me so badly? Please don't tell me racism is an, is an issue here in Australia. It is. That's our topic today, race and ethnicity. I want to walk us through the whole Bible, and then we'll have a panel, and then I'll wrap us up. So three quick points. Firstly, the human race. The human race. And we're going to start today, as we have done every week in this series, back in Genesis 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. I just can't repeat this enough. 
Every human being is created in the image of God for the glory of God. And so we're equal in dignity, equal in value, equal in worth. Please do not let anyone look down on you because of your skin color. It doesn't matter what your ethnicity is, your language is, your culture is. You're an image bearer of God. So no human being is more or less human than any other human being. And if we really believe that, perhaps we'd never have to be talking about some of the horrific ethnic cleansings of our human history. The Armenian genocide in Turkey in 1915 with a million slaughtered. The Holocaust in Germany with six million slaughtered. The, the Rwandan genocide in 1994, and perhaps, dare I say, the cleansing here in Australia. Because the core of, of all these sickening events were, were people who believed that their race was somehow superior to another, another race. But that's the problem. Uh, we use this word race, and what we mean by that is skin color or hair texture or physical characteristics. So let me ask you, what race were Adam and Eve? What race were Adam and Eve? And the answer is really simple. They were the human race. The human race. We're not told what their race or ethnicity was. We're not told they were Hebrew or Egyptians or Canaanites or Cushites. We're not told what their skin colors were. Uh, I've assumed they're not white and fair-haired. It doesn't matter. You ever thought that maybe Adam and Eve could have had different skin colors? It's irrelevant. Whatever your skin color, you're created by God in the image of God for the glory of God. This is the human race. Equal dignity, equal worth. And so the human race starts off gathered in the garden. And then because of the fall, because of sin in Genesis 3, they're scattered outside of the garden and they begin to multiply. And then in Genesis 6 to 9, God shrinks the world down again to one family, Noah and his wife and his sons. Now, Genesis 10 is a really important chapter. It's called the Table of Nations. It's like the Ancestry.com for, for Noah and his family. And it's fascinating because the people divide into clans and languages, and there are 70 different people groups. And before long, you've got people with different skin colors, with different cultures, living in different lands. But please remember this. They have a common ancestry. They're all traced back to Noah, who's traced back to Adam and Eve. You ever thought about that? It was about eight years ago in church one Sunday when a lady came up to me and said, Paul, did you know that we're related? And my jaw kind of dropped as I looked at this lady. She's done her family tree. And just a few generations back, four or five, uh, there was a family in the UK from which I am descended. Uh, and one of the brothers left and moved to Malaysia and married a Malaysian woman. And from that line in Malaysia, Donna Lido was born, a member of our 6 p.m. family. And yes, Donna and I are related. And it blows your mind. But it shouldn't. Because we all descended from one family. Acts 17, verse 26, from one man he made all the nations. We call the human race. So can we get rid of all these race labels? Those statements like, I am white, I am black, I am colored. What does that even mean? Because your skin color is not your identity. And the problem is we start to attach stereotypes and assumptions to those skin colors. It's like gender, what happens when you don't fit the stereotype? What happens when there's no neat skin color classification? When you have an interracial marriage, you come up with terms like Eurasian. And if we're honest, we can be so offensive. Like we look at people of a certain skin color, uh, like, like South Americans, and we just lump them all together as though Peruvian and Argentinian and Bolivian and Chilean cultures are identical. How offensive is that? Now, what race are you? You're the human race. 
That might get rid of our racism. And number two, the ethnically diverse human race. The ethnically diverse human race. Because our God delights in diversity. You get a glimpse of that at creation. Now, all the, the difference is in, in a fish and the birds and the animals is spectacular. And it's the same with the human race. Back to Genesis 10, this table of nations. Are these sons of, of Noah, Ham, Shem and Japheth. We get the beginning of ethnic diversity with scattered people groups. There's a repeated phrase. It, it comes three times. Genesis 10 verse 31. These are the sons of Shem by their clans and languages, in their territories and the nations. Verse 32. For from these the nations spread out over the earth after the flood. And so right at the beginning, we've got different clans or tribes speaking different languages or tongues, living in different territories or cities in different nations or countries, and God scatters his people. And we find out why in Genesis 11 with that Tower of Babel story. Up until this point, one people, one language. But the people gather together to, to build a city and to build a tower that will reach the heavens. Why? so we can make a name for ourselves. Now, that's the issue. It's called pride. Make a name for yourself, thinking you are the best people, the best race. Instead of making, using your skills and your intellect to serve God and to bless others, you want to stand out and be the best. Pride. And I do think that's at the root of a lot of racism. Pride and prejudice thinking our way is the best way. Our culture is the best and only culture. And God came down at Babel, and he judged pride. He confused their languages so they couldn't understand each other and couldn't communicate. And he scattered the people. 11 verse 9. From there the Lord scattered them over the face of the earth. So this is the beginning of the ethnically diverse, scattered global people. And for centuries, all these different people groups lived quite separately. Uh, there was occasional intermixing, occasional clashes. But then global migration happened. And, and people moved across the continents. And different clans or tribes speaking different language moved to the same cities and lived together. And we call it multiculturalism. And it should be good and beautiful and enriching. Today, there are roughly 200 nations. But there's roughly 15,000 different people groups who self-identify by their culture, language, history, religion, food, and music. And that's the country we live in, Australia. We are multicultural. You know, walk down the street and you see restaurants with Vietnamese, Filipino, Indian, Greek, Turkish, Lebanese restaurants. God's heart, he loves all these different people. You see that in Genesis 12. When God chose Abraham and God says, I will make a nation out of you, he called them Israel. And I think we sometimes read that and we think, well, God is elevating one race above another. God is racist. No, he's not. He's creating this nation to be a, a blessing to all the other nations. That's the heart of God. And what race was Israel? In terms of skin color, they're, they're kind of like modern-day Israelis. But in terms of ethnicity, they are, they're multi-ethnic. They're diverse. I don't think you realize that. Take Abraham. He's from Mesopotamia. So in terms of his ethnicity, he's kind of an Amorite or an Aramean. But Abraham migrated to Canaan. And his descendants married Canaanites. And then Joseph married an Egyptian. And by the time you get to Exodus chapter 12, when God is redeeming his people after 400 years of slavery, Exodus 12 verse 28 says, a mixed multitude left. People from different ethnic groups, all part of the people of God. Come to Numbers 12. And Moses has two wives. Zipporah is a, is a, a Midianite. And his other wife is a Cushite, that is a black woman. 
Uh, the Cushites uh, appear over 50 times in the Old Testament. They're sometimes called the Ethiopians, different to modern-day Ethiopia. It was a country just south of Egypt, a powerful black African nation. And lots of Cushites became part of the people of God. And let me clarify, I, I know scriptures warn against uh, marrying into the foreign nations. It's, it's not talking about interracial marriages. It's talking about interreligious marriages where you're marrying someone who worships a different God. But God loves diversity. Rahab, she was a Canaanite. Ruth was a Moabite. So you have this ethnically diverse people of God. God never intended the Jews to be ethnically superior. That was their sin. That was their pride. That racial hatred of calling the Gentiles dogs, looking down at the people, that's not God's heart. They were supposed to be a light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be the glory of God to the nations. They were supposed to welcome the foreigner, show kindness and grace. Exodus 22, verse 21, Do not mistreat or oppress a foreigner, for you were foreigners in Egypt. Deuteronomy 10, verse 18, God defends the cause of the fatherless and the widow. He loves the foreigner residing among you, giving them food and clothing, and you are to love those who are foreigners. For you yourselves were foreigners in Egypt. That, that is the heart of God. He loves the foreigners. The word foreigner is a, a sojourner or we might say an immigrant. Somebody who's separated from their family and their land. And we're told that God loves them. And so are, so are we. There's so much I, I really want to say right now on this immigration topic, but I can't. I will say this. Immigration is not a problem to be solved. It's a people to love. And immigration is not about numbers or caps. It's about a heart of compassion and treating people with dignity. Because God loves ethnic diversity. And can I also say, if you are willing to embrace different ethnic cultures in our church and in our world, your lives will be enriched and your experience of God will be richer and deeper and more profound. So the human race, the ethnically diverse human race, and lastly, the, the united in Christ human race. Listen to Isaiah 56 verse 8. The Sovereign Lord declares, I will gather still others to them beside those already gathered. That is God bringing in other people, God uniting a diverse people, God gathering a scattered people. Now, how is God going to do that? And the answer comes in the form of an immigrant. Because 2,000 years ago in a backwater town called Bethlehem, a child was born and his parents, Mary and Joseph, were immigrants. They, they fled the brutal political position in Bethlehem, went down to Egypt, and Jesus lived and was raised as, a, as an immigrant. Now, ethnically, Jesus was Jewish. Uh, he wasn't black or white. He was probably dark-haired and darker-skinned. But with all of us, it doesn't matter what he looks like. It's what he came to do that matters. And the Lord Jesus came to unite and to gather different scattered people. And the Lord Jesus Christ didn't have a discriminating bone in his body. He loved, taught, cared for, healed all peoples from all nations. Now, I love the, the story of the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, that, that woman who's full of, of shame and pain. And on that, on that day where she goes to that well to draw water, in the heat of the day, the Lord Jesus Christ talks to her and asks her for a drink. And the woman says this, John 4 verse 9, You are a Jew, I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews don't associate with Samaritans. And then Jesus breaks down all these racial barriers, all these ethnic barriers, all these gender barriers, and he treats it as a human being. And he gives her water that will well up to eternal life. And then he says, one day, these people won't worship on different mountains, but we'll be together as one, worshiping in spirit and in truth. That is the power of Jesus. That is the power of the cross. 
Because the Lord Jesus Christ is not just dying for the sins of the world. He's not just dying for your sins and my sins. He is dying to to reconcile and unite diverse people to himself and to each other. That's what Paul is going on about in Ephesians 2. He's talking to the Gentiles. He says this, Remember, at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise. Without hope and without God, you were hopeless and godless. But now, now that Jesus has come, you who are once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, by a blood that is thicker than the blood of any common language or any cultural distinctions. For he, Jesus, is our peace. Peace is found in no one else but Jesus Christ, who has made these two people groups one, united them, and has destroyed the barrier that dividing wall of hostility and hatred. Verse 18, for through Jesus, we both have access to the same Father by the same Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners or strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of his household. Now, that's the power of the gospel. One people, one family, one Lord. Now, now don't mishear me. I am not saying that we wipe out all cultural and ethnical distinctions. That's a terrible mistake that Christians have made in the past. Wipe out your history. Wipe out your heritage. Let's celebrate our ethnic backgrounds, our cultural distinctiveness. Let's learn from each other. It enriches us. And it just shines to how this gospel brings us together as a united people. And it's so powerful when you see it at work. It's Acts chapter 2 with Pentecost, where all these different people from different nations come together in Jerusalem. And they hear the gospel in their own tongues because the Spirit of God has come. It's the city of Antioch in Acts chapter 11, where Antioch was divided into 18 different antagonistic ethnic groups. But the followers of Christ were first called Christians at Antioch because they were united in Christ. And they took the gospel to the world. So powerful. I remember standing in a church in South Africa. And there was Afrikaans speaking and Kosa speaking and Zulu speakers and English speakers, black, white and coloured. But we were united in Christ. It was so powerful. I remember speaking at a conference with a, a Serbian and a Croatian and these two people who hated each other by, by, by birth and by nature were one in Christ. All hatred gone. I remember hearing how great is our God sung in 10 different languages at the same time. It was profoundly powerful. I love the story of, of Steve Saint. He is the son of Nate Saint, who was that missionary who was killed in Ecuador with Jim Elliott. Now, you know that story. All five missions were killed by the spear of the Alka tribe. But you might not have heard of a man called Minkau. Min Kao was a man who killed Nate Saint with a spear. And Min Kao became a Christian, a believer in Jesus. Now fast forward a few years later, and Steve Saint, the son of Nate Saint, is being baptized. And who's baptizing him? Min Kao. You've got this, this, this white man in, in Western dress and this, this black man in tribal dress. Uh, you've got this, this man who's speaking English and this man who's speaking his tribal language. You've got the man whose father was killed and the man who killed his father. And these two men come together in Christ. That is profoundly powerful because they are brothers in Christ. And that's what the gospel does. And that should be the witness of the church. The church of Christ has been born. We should be displaying to the world that we are one despite our ethnic and our cultural and our skin color differences. So why is it so hard? Why is it so hard? Why is there so much subtle racism even in our church? Why are there still so many ethnically monochrome churches even here in Sydney? It's always been hard. It's almost like our cultural divisions are so deeply ingrained 
Read the New Testament. The early church found it really hard. The Jews and Gentiles found it really hard to do church together. I think that's why God kept on saying, love each other, love each other, love each other. Why is it hard? We just find it so much easier to, to gather with people who are like us because then we can agree on a style of worship or a, a, the language of the, of the sermon. Now, now, don't mishear me. I, I do think that ethnically specific evangelism can be really helpful for mission. Uh, when when you, can, you can get past the language barrier or the nonverbal barriers, when you can understand a culture and an ethnicity, it can be profoundly helpful for evangelism. But when it comes to church and God save people gathering together, I do have a problem with this sort of ethnically, culturally, nationally monochrome church. Because the Lord Jesus Christ has supposedly destroyed those barriers. So why are we building them back up again? One church, one family, one faith. So why are we slightly racist? It could be creation. We don't really believe that all people are in the image of God. It, it could be we don't understand the cross that we're one in Christ. But I actually think it's just pride. It's just pride that we think that we are superior or better. And we're so blinkered. It's almost like when you're part of a majority culture like I am, you just assume that your culture is the right culture. I experienced just a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of that when I came to Australia as an Englishman. But nothing, nothing like what some people experience. So I'm going to invite Susan and Tan and Wendy and Ethan to come and discuss what it's like for them, uh, to discuss what ethnicity and, and race is like for them. Well, we've just heard uh, the glorious picture of Revelation 7, where every people of every nation are gathered together around the throne of God. And here at church, we can actually practice a little bit of that because we have people from lots of different backgrounds and nationalities. And so we're going to spend some time talking about um, what it looks like to live this out. Now, as we discuss this, we all know that it's really painful to try and uh, relate to people who are different from us. And it's not just about race. And so as we talk about this, our aim isn't to shame or embarrass anyone for mistakes that they might have made in the past, but actually create a safe space where people can learn, maybe also do a bit of unlearning, and also think about how we can grow together because of these experiences. And so we have um, very generously have had Ethan and Tan from 7pm and Wendy from 5pm joining us. And as we discuss these questions, some of them might seem a little bit hard, but they've actually um, very kindly had a look at all of them and have said that they are happy to discuss all the things um, that we're discussing today. So thank you for joining us. Now, guys, to kick us off, Paul talked about the beauty there is in diversity. Can you tell us about a time when you've seen that being actually really well practiced in the church setting? Allow me to start first. Um, this is an easy one. That's why I put my hand up first. And the, I think it, um, visually, it's the moment that I walk into into church and be greeted by this team of people from very many different backgrounds, and then walking, stepping into church, noticing a cross section of culture united in worship. But also for me is noticing that cross section, but also not noticing that cross section. Because we are, to me, it's just, yeah, we're here to worship. Cool. Anything to add, guys? I think the church has been a great uh, part of the community in showing what diversity looks like. And this panel alone shows, you know, how diverse the church can be. I think one thing to note, though, from, I guess, experience in the community and even in the church to some extent is that you can have a diverse church, um, but you can still have a separated church. 
Uh, and I think sometimes we fall into the trap of expecting, you know, one particular cultural group or one particular racial group to be the one that's responsible for welcoming, loving and caring for those within their own cultural group and racial group, not only within the community, but sometimes uh, within the church. Um, but I, I've seen this church in particular come, you know, a long way in, in welcoming others and, um, you know, showing love to different backgrounds. But, you know, I think one thing we can challenge ourselves a bit more to do is think, you know, who am I speaking to on a, on a regular basis, you know, in a normal environment when I come into church? Uh, do they have the same background as me? Is it the same group of people all the time? Um, because I think there's a, a real benefit in learning from people from, from different backgrounds, at least from what I've experienced. Well, you guys have talked about kind of the beauty of culture and how that interacts with our faith already a little bit for us. How have you guys tried to engage with people from other races and cultures um, in church? I think, um, Ethan, I think you wanted to talk about this a little bit with how you serve. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, one of the uh, ministries I really wanted to get involved with when I first joined was welcoming. Um, because to me, when you, uh, you know, walk past the church, what you see is the people outside welcoming. And if you have never been inside a church, all you will, you know, see are the people outside. Uh, and so if you have one particular group of people, one type of background outside, that can really challenge what people think about, you know, who the church is and, and who is involved within the church. Uh, and so one thing I wanted to do was to join a welcoming team to, you know, share and show the diversity that we have as a church. Um, and so I encourage everyone to get involved in the welcoming team uh, because the more backgrounds, the more people we have, then the more that we can show the broader community how diverse and, and you know, what great backgrounds exist within this church. Yeah, I, th I think um, one lovely thing about culture is that everyone seems to have um, different ways that they do things well. And so I, I personally have loved just getting to know different cultures and, and learning from them in different ways of how to do life and, and how to live out as Christians as well. So, yeah, I think, um, yeah, just learning, like you were saying, is just such a blessing. Um, yeah, and really challenging ourselves to, to think um, – who, who don't I actually know much about or know their culture about and, and actually genuinely asking sensitively um, why people do things or, or why we celebrate them in this way. Um, and then learning that, and that really helps just us to engage in a more positive way and redeem this culture of you know race and segregation by honouring and respecting other elements of each other's culture. Yeah. Uh, one of my favourite things about all the different cultures is the food. <laughs> Ask anybody about food and they'll start talking. <laughs> um, so how can church be a place where we can set an example uh, where all people can be united together? Um, yeah, look, <laughs> I think I'm taking this one. So I think um, the way I see a church can unite all backgrounds is, um, is to intentionally build diversity and inclusion and foster a belonging environment in any church-related context. And um, the analogy that I do like to use when I think about diversity, inclusion and, and belonging is um, diversity is like being invited to a dance party and inclusion is being asked to dance. And, um, and do you feel belong belonging to the dance floor? It's like you're dancing like nobody's watching. And, and that way, you know, it's that psychological safety that people can express their authentic self um, without fear of judgment. To me, that um, would be, you know, idealistic, but that would be a nice health check every now and then. Anything else? I think to add to Wendy's point uh, quickly, another way we could practically do this as well is and, and going back to point, what Point was sharing as well in his um, sermon, uh, challenging your preconceived notions of what a different cultural background might be. Um, I think a, a quite a funny example which comes to mind is, you know, a lot of people when, <laughs> I think I shared with this with yourself before, Susan, was, you know, a lot of people assume that I work in IT uh, because of my background. Um, I don't work in IT and I, I don't think I'd be very good in IT. Uh, but I think, you know, when you have a preconceived notion about a different culture, a different racial background, it really challenges 
the ability to have a deep relationship and develop a deep relationship with them. Uh, and so removing those potential stereotypes or uh, potential, you know, subtle ignorances which might exist and actually, you know, wanting to understand what a different background is and learning about the similarities and, and differences is, is a, you know, a great thing to do. Oh, well said. That was great. <laughs> well, ki that kind of leads into kind of the next question that I had. Um, it's kind of like we planned it. Um, <laughs> it's really easy to assume when you're part of the majority that there is no such thing as racism within our church or even in Australia. Um, so, have you guys noticed any blind spots that we might have, and uh, what can we do about it? I think Tan, you wanted to kick us off. Oh, uh, we always have blind spots. Like everyone has blind spots in every topic, and so um, I think the beauty of having a community is sharing with one another and encouraging one another and pointing out blind spots. So, thank you for letting us speak now into some blind spots. Um, but yeah, we're all in it together. I think we always, um, as Paul said earlier, like we are all a little bit racist, um, whether intentionally or unintentionally. I think because we grew up in in a culture, we might be influenced to um, have a, a particular understanding straight off the bat um, without any actual personal experience. Um, so I think as a culture, we are getting better. I think uh, we're not experiencing so much of the the blunt. Um, horrific uh, racism just day to day. But uh, as you were saying, I think um, as Australians, I think we have accepted maybe too much. Um, there's a lot of, uh, personally I've found a lot of jokes. I think that's what gets me the most and that's what I've been most convicted by myself and I've felt that I need to change the most actually is um, saying jokes myself or putting up with jokes in a conversation um, and just allowing them to happen. I think that actually can sometimes be so harmful. And I, I think if we're funny, we can think of better jokes, honestly. Um, so that's been something that I've been working on, um, not saying them, just holding my tongue, but also um, yeah, addressing it, being like, actually, that's not funny. Like, let's not do that. Um, but I think also on this journey of... Um, you know, redeeming our culture from this topic of, yeah, of this segregation. Um, as we get better, I think while we are getting better, I think we're still healing. I think there are a lot of people that are still um, struggling and feeling um, quite isolated, even though maybe we're getting better at it. Um, and I think a lot of that um, comes up when we make maybe in sensitive comments accidentally we don't realize it um, but that is quite triggering and it can be quite isolating sometimes and so I'd really love to encourage us as a church to consider how we can um, think about what we say first so like if it's simply that comment about IT um, maybe it wasn't ill intended but wondering and questioning um, firstly is that helpful is that actually a really encouraging comment? Because we want to be encouraging as Christians. But also wondering um, why we have that idea. Like where did that come from? Does that come from because someone said that Ethan works in IT and that's what I'm following it off from? Or is it because um, we just have subconsciously something that we've just been told but actually we need to unlearn and work on? So those would, those would be my, my two things. So jokes I think we can do better um, but also just pausing to think before we say something so that we can be loving to our brothers and sisters yeah but also I think if I may add um, having cultural blind spots are actually you know blind spots in general I think everyone who, who who's been in a car know it's dangerous not just to yourselves but also to others and having that cultural blind spot um, and probably a lower awareness of cultural um, sensitivity can actually lead to bad or not good decisions where, you know, a decision may be made in absolute good faith, but you've inadvertently excluded others without realising. And, um, you know, it could also lead to um, bad reactions to situations. Um, I have been asked by an Asian, or oh, actually twice, if I am an Asian. So, <laughs> so that kind of happens and, and that was probably one of my jaw-dropping moments when it comes to uh, cultural experiences. Well um, w this year 2021 is year of loving our neighbour. Um, how can we take year of loving our neighbour and welcoming from people of different cultures um, and combine those things in how we look after each other? I think um, you know obviously 
Tan and, um, and Ethan has already shared many, many good points on this. I, um, if I may summarise, I think the way to do it is um, to think beyond race and ethnicity, um, to, to see it from the other's lens and experience it yourselves. I mean, that chicken feed isn't that as bad as you think it is. And, um, or, you know, go for it. You know, try that chicken heart in a Brazilian churrasco. Far out every time I look at her and go. <laughs> but you've got to try it out to, to really experience it and, and understand that perspective and, and have a better appreciation and how we can love our neighbours a bit more. Well, um, thank you guys for being willing to talk about some of the things that um, I'm sure were not pleasant experiences. Um, do you guys have any final things to um, say or exhort us with? I think it was great to hear the open mic, particularly Roz, share about you know some of the other great ministries we do uh, with Everyday English. Uh, and so I think there's a lot of great things that this church is doing uh, to show how we love and care from p for people of different backgrounds and different races. I think one thing I want to encourage the church to do is, you know, next time we're back in person, you know, really challenge yourself to, you know, go and speak to people of different backgrounds who you might not normally do um, or, or meet uh, and, and challenge yourself to love them in different ways. Um, thanks for sharing, guys. And let me just pray and ask God uh, for, for his help in um, doing this better as a church. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you that you are a God who's created all nations. And we thank you so much for the beautiful picture we have of this reality being played out in heaven. We pray that as we try to um, replicate that in this sinful earth, we ask for your help. We ask for your grace. We ask for your patience. We ask for your wisdom. And we pray that we may continue to be a people that loves you and is hospitable and is willing to go the extra mile in loving people who are different from us. And we pray that we may be able to display a little slice of heaven with us here at church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks, Susan. Thanks to all who shared. I want to leave you just, just three very quick things. Firstly, please lament. Uh, please lament our past hurts and harms and failures. Uh, we can't undo them, but we can learn from them. And we can actually move forward and be different. Lament your own personal failures. Uh, the power of shame never changed anybody, but the power of the Spirit does change people. So ask God to change your heart for the way that you view other people of different ethnicities. Uh, secondly, love. Just love all people. Love every single human being created by God in the image of God for the glory of God. Love your neighbors, care for them, get to know them, get to understand their culture and shine Christ into that. So lament, love, and lastly, long. Just long for heaven. And the reality is the Bible tells us that we are, we're all strangers, we're all foreigners in this land. This is not home. We're heading to the better country, the true home. When we're joined with those multitudes from every tribe, nation, and people, and language. And as Revelation 5 says, these incredible words, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open the seals, because you, Lord Jesus, were slain. And with your blood, Lord Jesus, you purchased for God people from every tribe, language, and people, and nation. Amen.